Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate the third Sunday of Lent. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Anthony Egan. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Well, here we are, third week of Lent. I'm going to say it's almost over, but it's not quite. As we prepare ourselves to celebrate this Eucharist, let's call to mind our sins and ask God for mercy and forgiveness. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us and forgive us our sins and bring us life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, Look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. In those days, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. The law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The decrees of the Lord are steadfast. They give wisdom to the simple. Lord, Lord, you have have the the words words of of eternal eternal life. The precepts of the Lord are right. They gladden the heart. The command of the Lord is clear. It gives light to the eyes. Lord, Lord, you you have have the the words words of of eternal eternal life. life. The fear of the Lord is pure, abiding forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are, all of them, just. Lord, Lord, you you have have the the words words of eternal eternal life. life. They are more to be desired than gold, than quantities of gold. And sweeter are they than honey, than honey flowing from the comb. Lord, Lord, you you have have the the words words of eternal eternal life. life. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly 
to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Christ, King of eternal glory. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. Praise to you, Lord Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all, with the sheep and oxen, out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men and needed no one to bear witness of man, for he himself knew what was in man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This third Sunday of Lent, unlike most days in the church's calendar, we have a choice of readings. The one I have chosen recounts in the Gospel St. John's account of Jesus purging the temple in Jerusalem. It is one of the key points in Jesus' life, so key it seems in the memory of early Christian disciples who wrote the Gospels that it occurs in every one of them that we have in the New Testament. Though admittedly, John, whom we read today, places it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, while Mark, Luke, and Matthew, which were earlier Gospels in terms of their composition, placed it at the end, before the entry into, between the entry into Jerusalem and the Passion. By putting it at the beginning, John declares to us, the reader, that Jesus was an outsider from the beginning. Now, the majority of commentators, including myself, believe that Mark, Matthew, and Luke are probably more historically accurate. Up to this point, everything Jesus says and does, however controversial, can still be squared with a portrait of him as a kind of teacher, healer, and holy person, of whom there were many in first century Palestine. 
Even his debates that ended in conflict with other holy people can be seen as yet another internal debate among religious people who ended up on different sides of a theological or ideological fence. Indeed, sometimes debates can become very heated. Even, perhaps, dare I say it, among Jesuits. After all, where two or three Jesuits or rabbis gather together, you usually find four or five opinions. A number of contemporary Jewish scholars of Jesus further point out that there is nothing in his ethics that contradicted the Judaism of the time, which was theologically diverse and admitted many different opinions. He was also not alone in being a healer or a miracle worker, though apparently most of the time tended to charge considerably for their services, which he didn't. Even Jesus' claim to be the Son of God was not as outrageous to first century ears as we might imagine. A Son of God to Jewish ears meant a close connection to the Lord. It was a term often associated with King David or someone of royal line. By driving the money changers and company out of the temple, however, Jesus did two things. Firstly, he openly attacked the temple system and its backers. The high priests, who came from the ruling elite, headed ultimately by the monarchy. The same monarchy, who were seen by religious Jews of all kinds as spiritually corrupt and despised by virtually everyone for their collaboration with the Roman occupiers. This leads us to our second point. By his actions, Jesus caught the attention of the Romans, who saw his actions as nothing less than an act of revolt. In the past, Jewish rebels had almost always initiated a rebellion by a religious act. Now, for first century Jews, who saw God as their real true king, religion and politics was actually interchangeable. Now, whichever way you look at it, it's a shocking text for some of us. Jesus seems to use violence, apparently, for the first time. Now, as I read it, I can't but recall a wonderful movie of a number of years ago, V for Vendetta. Set in a near future where Britain has become a dictatorship, it tells the story of a masked revolutionary named V who sets out to overthrow the system. It begins with him one night blowing up the Old Bailey, London Central Criminal Court, which V perceives as no longer serving as a symbol of justice. As the movie unfolds, more targets, institutions, and leaders of the dictatorship are set to follow. It's great anarchist fun. It's well worth a watch. But now, is this analogy accurate? Did Jesus embrace violence? I don't think so. The words most often associated with the event, cleansing, purifying, point to something far more complex. They symbolize an overturning of a religious system that has been corrupted by those who should have known better. By turning the temple into a market, the authorities have undermined the very Mosaic law, which we read in our first reading, they claim to uphold and teach. Even as they provided a convenient, and for themselves lucrative, means for observant Jews to uphold the letter of the law, including the detailed laws of cult and sacrifice. Jesus is rightly outraged by this perversion of religion into a business. For him, the symbol of the temple has lost its meaning or value, and his agenda is clear. He wants to rebuild, to renew, and to restore the symbol. I wonder how many of us resonate with this. How many of us, when looking at public life, find a disconnection between the fine symbols of our society, democracy, rule of law, constitution, and the inefficient kleptocratic reality of public figures? And so too in our religious communities. How often, I find, indeed have heard, homilies about the Ten Commandments that reduce what is in effect an agenda for ethics to an obsessive series of do's and don'ts that treat reasonable adults like children. I also wonder how many Christians feel that the hidden message of their church is summed up in the mantra, pay up, pray up, and shut up. It is easy, too, 
to imagine that what we have is what we've always had and therefore unchangeable. Actually, no. Christian practice has changed over time. Tradition is both continuity and change. In these times, our normal practice of faith centered on Sunday worship has been put on lockdown, put in crisis. We've all had to scrabble frantically to adjust to the situation, as all of you watching this broadcast know. But crisis is also opportunity. An opportunity to rethink and revisit what is essential to our faith, to our worship, to our following of Christ. Lockdown in its various forms has overthrown our tables and driven us, for the most part, out of our temples. Lockdown has also given us the opportunity to reflect on what is essential to our faith and to re-examine our moral choices. This Lent, as we prepare for Christ's passion and resurrection again, let us consider what aspects we need to change. Not as an act of escaping God's law, but as a way of living it more fully, more authentically. Dare we become like Jesus, God's loyal outlaws? So let us together profess the faith we all share by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Having professed our faith, having reflected upon the word, let us bring our words of faith and supplication to the Lord. We pray that this land, a land lived in difficult times, we may open ourselves to how the Lord may be calling us to live out the calling of Christ and the law of God in our lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray that the church may see this time as an opportunity for growth to reimagine herself as disciples of Christ, to overturn ways that no longer bring people to God and to work towards ongoing reform and renewal. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray that all who hold public office will reject greed and self-interest so that all they do will contribute to the renewal of the communities they are called upon to save. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for all the sick, especially those with COVID-19, for those who care for them, and for all our dead. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We invite you to spend a few moments bringing to the Lord your particular needs. Lord, hear us. 
Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, we bring before you these prayers we make, spoken and unspoken. We ask you, as we ask you to renew us, to be with us, and to guide us, that you hear and answer these prayers according to your will. We make all these prayers in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, fruit of the earth, work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By this mingling of water and wine, may we be changed with him who shared our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of our hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the good of our holy Church. Be pleased, O Lord, with these sacrificial offerings, and grant that we who beseech pardon for our own sins may take care to forgive our neighbor. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you will that our self-denial should give you thanks, humble our sinful pride, contribute to the feeding of the poor, and so help us imitate you in your kindness. And so we glorify you with countless angels, as with one voice of praise we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You're indeed holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may become holy, just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray upon your people's offering and pour out on them the power of your Spirit, that they become the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we once were lost and could not approach you, you loved us with the greatest love. For your Son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread, and giving you thanks, said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself through the blood to be shed on the cross, he took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine and once more, giving you thanks, handed it to the disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace, we celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim who reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, and grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake of this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis our Pope, Booty our Archbishop, Duncan his auxiliary. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with St. Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints, and with all our deceased brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then freed at last from the wound of corruption, made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As the Saviour commanded and formed divine, by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the, for the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the, the glory of yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And with the Spirit. Lamb of God, we take away the sins of the world, and have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold, the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the sins of the world, how blessed are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter my youth, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and the blood of Christ bring us life everlasting. Amen. Although you cannot receive physical communion with us now, we invite you into a moment of spiritual communion. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, defines spiritual communion as an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Sacrament and a loving embrace as though we had already received him. His words are echoed by the great mystic and fellow doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, When you do not receive communion and do not attend Mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. At this moment, 
We invite you to focus on Christ and your longing for union with Him. Express your desire to feel His grace coursing through you, giving you strength and courage, particularly in these difficult times. In your desiring union, you are united with us and to Christ. In this moment, we experience the reality that is already here. Let us pray. As we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. There's a prayer over the people, so I'm going to pray this as well. Direct, O Lord, we pray the hearts of your faithful, and in your kindness grant your servants this grace, that abiding in the love of you and their neighbor, they may fulfill the whole of your commands through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. God.